I had the opportunity, the blessing from God that is, to travel this great land of Canada by bicycle and meet many of its wonderful people. I didn't have much of a plan or much cycling experience. In fact, only a few weeks of training on my new touring bike to my name. But I boarded a flight to Vancouver nonetheless, praying I'd get the help I needed to reach the Atlantic Ocean in Halifax, where my grandparents arrived in Canada over half a century ago. This little guy is not too happy that I'm leaving. He, he senses something. He sees all the boxes. I'm just at the Vancouver airport now, having a snack. And now I got to put the bike together, all this stuff. So we'll see how it goes. It's a bit hard <laughs> to put together. Um, so we'll see how fast I can do it. I think it took me about three or four hours to put that bike together. I really had very little knowledge about bicycles. I had a horrible migraine. I think it was from staying up late the night before, putting everything in a box. I had no clue what I was doing. Luckily, I had some help from my family and my girlfriend. And the next day after staying with a friend in Vancouver that night from McGill Soccer, I dipped my tire in the Pacific and read a note from my girlfriend. I had no clue what these notes were gonna be about, but I knew that they'd help me along my journey. This here, a bicycle ride around the world begins with a single pedal stroke. Scott Skoll, American adventurer on a quest for happiness around the world on a bicycle. I cherished my girlfriend's first note in my heart and took my first pedal stroke east in the rain and my second, and my third, and my fourth in the rain. It didn't stop raining in BC, but I was loving it. I got to mission that night, but on day two, things started going wrong a little bit. My handlebar bag started slipping in the front and I couldn't ride. So I had to stop at Independent Cycles in Mission BC, where Rocky, helped me so generously fix the handlebar bag for probably an hour and a half. It's a complex contraption, but he helped me and he told me a bit about his French Canadian family. Yeah, my family uh, immigrated to what not was Canada, was, was New France in the 1700s. So, wow. um, and then they homesteaded, my great grandfather homesteaded in Saskatchewan and then to Alberta. And my grandfather was raised in Alberta. My dad was raised in Alberta and I've been raised here, born and raised on the West Coast. So our uh, French Canadian family uh, has roots now here in Vancouver area, so. So do you have do you have any cousins you still keep in contact with out east or no? Yeah, uh, well, funny enough, we have some Blondins in Abbotsford that like uh, kind of came separate ways. And just recently, yesterday, I met somebody who knew my second cousin and I've never met him. Oh yeah? And so we have family all across the country, uh, in Crazy. Ontario as well, uh, in small pockets, so it's interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Rocky, for doing this. And thank you for fixing my bike, I really appreciate it. You're welcome and thank you for sharing your journey. We're excited to see, uh, I'm gonna watch. Thank you, thank you. As I reveled in the scenery that a kid from Toronto who thought the Humber River Trail was nice had never seen before in his life, I decided that I should check up on two worrying women, my girlfriend and my mother. He, I was thinking of your dad. Maybe I should stop and take a picture here. Yes, I'll leave you, okay? Bye, Alex. Bye. Bye. Love you, Pete. Be careful. Love you. I'm stopping. Bye. probably one of the most challenging days of my life. It was just constant climbs and I was heading up to Al Allison Pass, arguably the hardest summit of the trip and it definitely was for me because I headed there on a flat tire. Like I said, I didn't know much about my bike so it had a leak. So my, my tire was not fully pumped up at all and I realized this in Sunshine Valley. 
as I headed toward Manning Park. And Lynn, a wonderful, wonderful woman from Quebec, warned me about the snow and bears in Manning Park. C'est quoi que vous aimez le plus de Sunshine Valley ici? Ben, j'aime mon travail parce que depuis un an et demi, je suis, je vis dans mon RV. Donc, être ici dans un campground, c'est magnifique. Ouais. Puis euh, la vallée est magnifique. Ouais. <rire> c'est, 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 c'est parfait. Puis la semaine prochaine, je commence aussi deux jours euh, durant la semaine. Je vais être deux jours à Manning Park, cinq jours ici. Ah oh, ouais. Ouais, ouais. Oh, ouais? Moi, je vais à Manning Park ce soir. Ce soir, hein? Ouais. OK. C'est ça. Fais attention, il y a des ours, puis il y a tout ça, il y a de la neige, puis il y a toutes sortes d'affaires. Encore en chemin. Oui. Alors, euh, merci beaucoup, Lynn, et euh, ben, à bientôt. Fait, ben, ça me fait plaisir, puis euh, je te souhaite plein de fun, puis plein de rencontres. Ça va être cool au bout. Merci beaucoup. Je ne sais pas si vous pouvez voir dans l'air. C'est un tough day. Il y a de la neige, donc... Dans les mountains, il y a de la neige. Happened. I think flat tire. It's a journey, I tell you. I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one thing. You almost. You almost beat me. This Allison Pass summit almost beat me. 4,400 feet. 1,342 meters. As I stood there in my crazy, delirious, whacked out state from just biking an incredible day in the rain and walking as well in the rain, I made my way to Manning Park. And at Manning Park, of course, the restaurant was closed, so I had to eat chocolate bars for dinner. And I still had to go four kilometers, I found out, because Lightning Lake Campground was closed. So I headed to Hampton Campground, but I learned that everything happens for a reason because I got to stay with Julian, who offered that I stay on his campsite for free that night. And I was a bit reticent at first, but he turned out to be the coolest guy, a bird biologist. Yeah. Right now, this summer, I'm a contractor, so I've got a contract with Environment Canada to survey birds mostly here in Manning Park in the high elevation areas. So I go out every morning from 4.30 until 9 (laughs) a.m. Pretty crazy. And I count birds at a single point for 10 minutes and then I move to another location, usually within about a kilometer or two. So we're right now starting to work on high elevation birds uh, here in Manning Park and hopefully throughout the entire coast range. Um, climate change is often most strongly felt in high elevation communities. You know, mountain areas, as, as the conditions lower down in the valley start to creep up as climate change brings warmer temperatures, sometimes wetter or drier temperatures, it puts a lot of pressure on these high elevation bird communities that are kind of specialized on these mountain conditions. Mm. And so we're right now just trying to set up a monitoring system so we can detect changes you know, over the decades to come as uh, these, you know, it's, it's called a, an escalator, basically. The birds start marching uphill um, and... Uh, what, what does that mean, Esca- escalator? Yeah, sorry. So, it's actually kind of grim. The term is escalator to extinction. Um, and that's where these high elevation species that prefer to exist at, at higher, you know, mountaintop conditions, you know, they can only move up so far because the mountains eventually end. And, you know, as soon as their, their um, mountaintop conditions are, are gone with, with novel climates, then, you know, in theory, they may not be able to stick around for much longer. I went to sleep that night with a bitter taste in my mouth because of what Julian had just told me. And on top of that, all of my stuff was soaking wet from the days of cycling. My panniers were not waterproof. I learned that I had to put stuff in plastic bags in my panniers. 
So I should have bought more expensive panniers. But anyway, I woke up the next morning and I used Julian's lines here in his tarp to dry some of my stuff because it was soaking, soaking wet. And that was one of my worst nights camping. I could not sleep that well. I kept waking up because as you said, it was, it's cold there, right? It's in the mountains, there was snow. So I was freezing, freezing cold. But I got out, I fixed my tire. I was, I was proud of myself and I had a nice descent that morning. Day four was another eventful day. Going up that su Sunday summit, which was a bit easier with the proper tire on there. But I was feeling so good that it wasn't really raining. I was confident zipping down those hills. I was proud of myself for having fixed my flat tire. But I think I got a bit too cocky and God put me back in my place because I got a, an instant flat on day four. Front tire, heard it pop right away. And I went, I was like, oh, I can do this easy. I know how to change this now. But I put my Allen key in and I couldn't get the through axle off because of all the rain. And I had taken it off several times to try to, to put in a new tube. The did you know the days prior the grease had come off and really law and the thing was lodged in there i tightened it too much i didn't know my bike so i had to call caa on the side of the road and luckily randy my bike advisor had told me to call caa uh, to sign up for caa before leaving otherwise i don't know what i would have done uh, I've called CAA, hopefully they're going to come. Hopefully CAA is going to come help. Uh, yeah, that's my hope. So let's see what you have for me today. Day number four. It's been raining ever since the start. It is by riding a bicycle that you learn the contours of a country best. Since you have to sweat up the hills and coast down them. Ernest Hemingway. The next day the boys at the bike shop pretty easily took off my front wheel. They had the proper tool and they told me, you know, make sure that you don't tighten it too much. In addition to putting more grease on there for me because the grease had been wiped off due to the rain, but they said, don't tighten it so much. So that really helped me out, that tip. And they also told me to take the Kettle Valley Rail Trail, get off the highway for a little bit. Am I good to pass? All right, thank you so much. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> don't say They're beautiful. They come flying up and then like, what is that? For sure. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Almost fell off the bike there, but you had a good view. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was a bit of a bumpy ride there out on the KVR trail. Beautiful ride, but a bumpy ride. So my bike again stopped working. My fender was rubbing all over my back wheel and a bolt, because uh, one of the bolts from my rack had fallen off. So I had to stop and this guy walked by named Tyler and he was just a historian of the Okanagan Valley. And the Okanagan is the, it comes from the, the, uh, the Steelix or, or the Okanagan people. It means a place to sit on top. Oh, really? So that's where the name comes from. Oh, really? <laughs> so, so basically the valley, there's three parts to this, uh, the valley. It goes from a little town north of Kelowna called Enderby. And that's the North Okanagan and Vernon's the main hub there. And then you have what's the central Okanagan and Kelowna is the largest city and the largest city in the, Okan in the Okanagan. Kelowna, is, it means actually female, female grizzly or sow. Really? That's what the name means. But anyways, then you have, um, as you go sou southward, so starting from Summerland to Osoyoos to the U.S. border, uh, that's the south Okanagan. And um, 
um, sum, summer, I mean, Penticton actually means a place to stay forever. It's roughly translated that way, so. Uh, how do you know all this stuff? I, I went to college here and I just read, one day I just read the history books. I'd, I've been here for over 12 years. I'm originally from the Metro Vancouver area, Port Coquitlam, home of Terry Fox. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, <wow. laughs> but I, I, I I, I like I, I I like I said I, I have family and friends still down there but I I, I don't miss the rain I like the sunniness of the Okanagan and uh, what were you saying about the rain before uh, Vancouver versus so, so Vancouver um, I I don't have the approximate number but I know that it rains three times more than for instance London England okay. but Victoria which is nearby which is uh, which is just a you know just across the I guess the whole area they call it now the Salish S Salish Sea or Strait of Georgia. It, it, it actually, it's in a rain shadow, so it rains half the amount uh, as, as Vancouver. So, and you were saying before, here they would transport fruit, and what were you saying? They, they would transport um, fruit and, uh, and any other goods, that, like timber, and um, they, this was basically an artery between, uh, for, um, for the nearby, um, it, it would, they'd go south, like to the Similkameen or, or U.S. border, and it, and it would be an artery for, say, to go to the, to the Rockies. I made my way to beautiful Kelowna that night and stayed with the cousin of a, my dad's old, old neighbor, which was incredible that he allowed me to stay with him. Thank you so much for the hospitality. And I got to ride the next morning with his daughter, which was amazing to have someone with me and just enjoyed beautiful, beautiful Kelowna. Like I said, it, it looks like Italy here. <laughs> it was sort of uncanny that morning that I had met an Italian named Daniele from Italy who was working at Mountain Equipment Co-op and like any good paisano should, he hooked me up with some bolts for my bike. But we just discussed how Kelowna was so alike to Italy and how beautiful it was and how peaceful it was. But the peace of what seemed like Italy soon wilted away with a call from a worrying Italian woman. I'm riding. What do you think I'm doing? Uh, so that was the one yesterday, you know, you and it was the first, you know why stuff? It's because I had to push yesterday. I didn't want to be too late and you should never push, you know? I think you don't have to push too early in the morning. For sure. And then you're in a cycle. You're in a cycle that never ends because you get there late, you, you, you stay yeah. late. Then but it's going to be different. Event. It's going to be different tomorrow morning. I'm making myself leave uh, by 8 o'clock tomorrow. A bicicletta siamo noi che vinciamo lo spazio e il tempo, soli, senza nemmeno il contatto con la terra che le nostre ruote sfiorano appena. stuff i'm here at uh, campground in revelstoke it's beautiful i have a little friend here too i don't know if you can see him he's following me here i think he's the owner's uh, dog <laughs> and this is our view from the campground beautiful mountains there's mountains out that side too so it's pr pretty beautiful hey buddy come here hey so this is uh, day seven i think Look, he doesn't want me to read it. Hey, okay. All right, you want the paper? Okay, so it says here, it says, uh, sorry, my bike's falling. 
pills. We love them, we hate them. They make us strong, they make us weak. Today I chose to embrace hills. Hal Hingdon, American writer and runner. In the rest of BC, I saw incredible trees, encountered my first black bear, zipped through wicked tunnels. Here you go. Oh, oh. my bottle from a mountain when I ran out of water based on a tip from a friend. Conquered Rogers Pass. Rogers Pass, baby! Almost biked into bighorn sheep that jumped over the barrier at the last second. There's a bunch of goats! What the heck are you guys doing? interview Yvonne, a great storyteller and owner of a campground in Donald, BC. Oh, there, in 1961 there was a mad cow disease in uh, Quebec and my dad, he was given a hundred dollars a head for his cattle, his dairy, for dairy cow, and he moved everybody out west to uh, something, he was looking for something different to do. So, yeah. that's amazing. And, uh, so that you just dropped everything, your family dropped everything, sold everything, moved out west. And what did you do out west? Actually, he he's uh, he's well. He started logging. He got into actually first he got into diamond drilling, up oh, at really? up at High River. Yeah. Okay. And it, it, when he was working underground, he he got he kind of got a blinded himself a bit. Oh really? So it was kind of a dangerous thing. He he, he was gone for a year at a time. The conditions, the working conditions weren't too good at the time. They weren't too good at the time, not, not, in, the, not in those years there. No. So then we ended up moving down to Cranbrook, B.C. is when he started logging. He got into logging with uh, one of his uh, brothers. Okay. And from there, that's, uh, that's where we all moved. Uh, we, when we moved across Canada, there was eight of us at the time. Wow. And he loaded up, put his uh, mattress in the back of the station wagon, and we drove cross country. That's, that's amazing. The, oh, yeah. Yeah, it is, yeah. And uh, so when you when you came here, I'm guessing you guys all spoke French together. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh well, yeah. When we when we were at home, we had to speak French to mom and dad. Yeah. Yeah. That was the rule. That was the rule. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did you go to French school or English school? Growing no. Up? I, in those days, there was no French school. It okay. was yeah. You 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 did learn French in school. Yeah. But yeah, as a regular subject, but no, it was all uh, English school. So I'm sure you were. The best in your class in French, for sure. Oh, oh yeah. We, 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 it wasn't that bad. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, it's a totally different French than what they talk about for in school than, you know, the Paris French instead of the uh, Quebec French. is totally a, yeah. quite a bit of different words in LA. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And uh, is there any French 
community around here in BC? Uh, actually, there is. Uh, there is a French school here in, in Golden itself. Really? And, yeah, and there is a lot of French people around Golden area here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that speak French. I didn't know that. So are they new immigrants, let's say, from Quebec, or when did they come here? Is there French? Oh, well, see, uh, in the logging the industry, there's a lot of French people that came up and did logging there. Okay. And so this is, uh, Golden is a good, big logging town. Really? Uh, yeah, and there's still quite a few French families around it, around the Golden area. And after conquering the hardest province in the journey, by far, I entered Alberta and got to see Lake Louise, where I met someone who became a good friend of mine, Romain, who was a fellow bike tourist. Au Canada, en raison de la COVID, j'ai dit je vais venir en Colombie-Britannique avant les mesures soient sévères. Le 15 avril, j'étais parti pour quatre mois. Euh, et euh, là, ils ont mis les mesures plus sévères, donc j'ai resté ici pareil. J'ai fait attention à euh, ça. Puis mon genou a fait mal, ça fait que je vais raccourcir mon voyage un peu, le genou, okay. <rire> un peu d'un mois. J'irai pas au Yukon, j'étais peu d'aller vers le Yukon, puis revenir à, en Alberta, mais là, euh, on est en Alberta aussi ici, là. Ça fait Colombie-Britannique et Alberta, mais mostly Colombie-Britannique, là. Okay. If someone were to come to Canada to do some bike touring, what would you suggest? What would be the first place you would say, go, go here? I would say, uh, if they are not, don't know well uh, bike touring, I, I won't begin by uh, British Columbia and Alberta with all the hills. Yeah. <laughs> I will begin by some things suffer, like in Ontario, a lot of fat, in Quebec also, a lot yeah. of fat, old rail, road, rail, rail train okay. road. So that's, it's more flat and uh, things like that. And yeah. uh, begin by a couple of days and after the weeks, not for 10, 10, 10 months in a row. Yeah, but so uh, start short and well, then... Okay. And t but you can do a long, long trip without experience. You will make your experience by uh, other way, I will yeah, say, yeah, yeah. during <laughs> your trip. <laughs> hey, Steph. Uh, it's day 10 already. Can you believe it? It's incredible. Let's open up, see what it says. I just met a really nice guy, Romain. Did a great interview with him at uh, Lac Louise. Very, very, uh, very, very fun. Here, I'm at a great lookout off the uh, 1A in Alberta. And your message today says, the road, it's a good listener. From an anonymous uh, author. And then you wrote, profite de ces moments, de quiétude et de paix. So, which means, uh, take advantage of these moments, you know, of uh, peace and quiet. Uh, After those 10 days in BC in the beginning of Alberta, my legs were just dead. They were fine those first 10 days, but day 9 and day 10, it was getting rough. They just felt like jello a little bit. So I was really fortunate to be able to stay with my brother's legendary friend, Slemko, whom I'd never met before, but I'd soon find out that he was an interesting character. Matthew, do you think you'll end up here one day? Do you think you'll live here? Maybe. <laughs> I see where the <laughs> path takes me. Exactly. You're a good canoeer, man. Thank you. You're good. I'm not doing any of the work here. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Under the bridge. <laughs> After two nights and one day of absolutely necessary rest for my jello legs, I got back on the road and had to go through this obscure sort of forest because the road was closed on my way to Calgary. And when I got to Calgary, I got to interview a really nice guy, skateboarder, in an, in an amazing, apparently famous skate park in Calgary. 
And uh, what do you think about skateboarding finally being in the Olympics now? I think it's about time. You know, it's it's a serious sport. You know, it doesn't. It, it, I think it's the sport that requires the most tenacity and uh, um, resilience because you have to fall a thousand times and try a trick a million times before you land one. Yes. So, and then after that it gets better and better. So it doesn't. I do it like I said for my son because it teaches him discipline and to stick to something. Yeah. And uh, like I said, tenacity and, and perseverance. So your son also skates? Well, I'm trying to get him into it. Okay. He's, he's also a soccer player. He's all over the place right now. He's at an age that. Uh, He's my monkey. Yeah. <laughs> After staying in a stranger's backyard, thanks John, in Calgary, I soon learned that Google Maps could lead me just a little bit off road. On a dirt road that Google Maps sent me on. Uh, I don't really know. I asked an RCMP officer actually where to go. Gotta head all the way down here. So I need some words of encouragement. So day 12, right here, is a car coming, I think, in the distance, so I'll make it fast. The best routes are the ones you haven't ridden. Uh, an anonymous author, and you wrote, no matter where you are at that moment, enjoy the journey. <laughs> That's a perfect one for today. Um, yeah, because I've never ridden a road like this and it's super hard to ride and some parts it's so sandy and, gr you know, full of gravel that I can't even ride it, so I have to get off my bike. But, uh, yeah, I'll do my best. Thanks, Steph. Once again, I miss you. On that sunny, sunny day when I got off the beaten path a little bit, I ran out of water. I was so, so thirsty and there was nothing around. And finally I saw this gas station on the Siksika First Nation and the chief was there and he saw me and he offered me cold, fresh water from their spring and it was the best water I had ever tasted. Such, such a nice man and so encouraging. This hawk keeps flying with me. This hawk keeps flying with me here. Like he keeps stopping, and then when I pass him, he keeps coming. I'm nervous now. <laughs> Look, he moved again. Once I get to him, then he keeps going. It's right there. Look, he stopped. Let's see, once I pass, is he gonna come with me? See, he's coming again. See, look here. Oh, now he's turning around. Hope he's not going to attack me now. He kept doing that for a good couple minute, two minutes. Hey Steph, I'm uh, here in uh, Saskatchewan. Sorry for the noise. It's pretty much exactly two weeks into the trip. Uh, it's been a heck of a ride, you know, thus far, and uh, I thank you for all your words of encouragement. So, uh, day 14, let's read your little message here. Um, I'm fired up. Here we go, Saskatchewan. Okay. Day 14, day 14. No matter how slow you go, you're still lapping everyone on the couch by an anonymous author and she wrote like Steph you'll think that's not true I know you're working hard <laughs> Saskatchewan <laughs> clouds look like the clouds from Toy Story hey Steph behind me you will see some salt and this actually comes from uh, Chaplin Lake uh, which is just saturated with the stuff and it's pretty incredible you you go by it and it looks like snow so I thought of you in Montreal and everything and uh, I also thought of you because there are a bunch of birds there are I think over a hundred thousand birds that migrate here in Chaplin uh, Saskatchewan and they're from South America and they're just beautiful beautiful birds um, today is day 16 okay day 16 is a big day 
because you gave me three little packs of these cards and this is the start of the second pack so I'm, get, I'm getting there. I'm sorry, it's very sunny if I'm squinting. Okay, uh, day 16. And I also thought of you because of the birds, right? Because uh, you love birds. All right. It hurts because it matters. John Green. And the hurt was not only physical, but mental, being out there solo on the road. But it really was the encounters that kept me sane at times. Like this encounter I had with two beauties from Magog in Quebec crossing the country the other way. I heard them screaming from the other side of the highway. Hey, hey. COVID and everything has been nice meeting yeah. just normal people and stuff, but probably the nicest was as soon as we got in Saskatchewan, being able to actually sit down in a place with air conditioning yeah. and eat, not by dumpsters. Oh, really? So, yeah, because oh, yeah. Ontario's closed. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. There, there's a few times that we're just outside pouring rain, eating our subway under, under a little shelter. Like, man, I wish I could go inside. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. That's, but that's insane. No, but I say people. I mean, the people that you meet on this trip kind of make it worthwhile, you know? Yeah, like you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, man. We and both you. had this discussion. We think we're biking uphill. Alex thinks he's biking uphill. Yeah. 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 Which, who's right right now? <laughs> it's Saskatchewan, man. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so you guys are saying everyone says Saskatchewan's flat, but it's not true, right? No, no. it's not flat. <laughs> Alex is biking downhill and we're biking uphill. <laughs> He's got the wind, we got the wind yeah. to our face. No, yeah, it's, uh, no, it's not flat. You can see forever, but it's yeah, not flat. Yeah, for miles and miles, eh? It's yeah, it's really beautiful. And, uh, what were you guys saying about these bags here? Yeah, these bags are like 50 plus years old. When our dad was uh, 22, him and a couple buddies were, well, biked a huge portion of the country. They went from Vancouver Island to Winnipeg, and uh, they decided, I think they ended up at the Winnipeg Folk Festival and just ended up quitting and having a good time there, but uh, they were his bags when he went across, so I got the front, and Dan's got the back. That's great, so your, your dad's with you the, uh, the entire trip. Yeah, 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 big time. We finish it off because he did the he did the west coast and we finished off the east coast for him. Yeah, yeah. so this is made across the country just about. Yeah. And, and what what were you saying, guys, about this being officially the longest trip you've done now? Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. the longest trip. Well, what was the other uh... mileage wise? Well, it's, we're congratulating ourselves today because a couple years ago we canoed the Mississippi River. Wow. <laughs> so from start to finish, there was Lake Itasca, Minnesota finished in the Gulf of Mexico oh it's 3,699 kilometers and today we surpassed it so it is officially yeah. there you go, yeah, no, that's, that's a pretty big achievement and on yeah. bike we're by the way we're not avid cyclists no. like, neither am I so. this, no. <laughs> this was his bike from when he was 14 I just picked this, really? picked this yeah. up from like just for this trip yeah oh my gosh and I mean here we are it's been great let me ask you one question have you guys fought at all on the trip no. No? Yeah. No? No. That's no. good. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the Mississippi, though, out of 71, we have one day. One day. But other than that, on bike, you just, you know to leave your distance. Somebody's having a bad day. And I was right. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're, we're raising money for Central West Coast Forest Society. And they're uh, based out of Eucalypt. Okay. Uh, it's a non-profit organization. They do salmon habitat restoration. So they remove log jams, they uh, plant trees and shrubs in riparian zones, they uh, put spawning gravel into the streams. They're basically just trying to bring the, the, these salmon spawning streams back to a, use, like a, a usable, you know, a usable stream that the salmon, that the salmon can actually like thrive in. Eric and Dan from the side of the road, as I call them, put me in contact with this guy, Jesse, who was absolutely shredding the country, going super fast, faster than I was, a lot faster, to get home and see his kids like any good dad should. And they saw him later and then put us in contact. So we stayed at the same campground one night and randomly this woman, as I was interviewing Jesse, joined our conversation and she actually turned out to be the first ever woman from Saskatchewan to ride NASCAR. 
and the first ever indigenous woman to ride NASCAR. It's too bad she told me that after the interview. I would have asked her some questions about that. But she still had some super funny stories about our boys, Eric and Dan. Um, there was some guys that they started in Montreal. It took them 47 days to get here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do yeah. they so, stay here? Yeah, they stayed here. Do you, do you, like, do you live here? Or? Uh, no, I just work at oh. the grain terminal here. Oh, cool. Oh, so uh, yeah. we, we saw them. Dan yeah, and Eric. Yeah, we saw them, yeah. Oh, yeah, the big yeah, beard. that's them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, yeah, Dan, Dan was hanging out with me, and then he, like, I don't know if you got like a heat stroke or something, but like oh, yeah. he just like like went like this and collapsed. I was like, Are you oh. serious? <laughs> I was like, I only first aid, but I was like, oh my god! Really? Yeah. Really? In, yeah. the, in the nighttime or? Yeah, it was in the night. You know. Oh my god. So what happened was uh, Alex met them earlier in the day yesterday. Yeah. And then because you don't see many people on the road on the bike, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so then I was riding, and they yelled out over to me, so we chatted, and then they gave me his number. Which yeah, is, and then yeah. we said we plan to meet here, sort of. Yeah, um, I race cars. Oh yeah. So, I like I, I like whenever in the summertime I always like the Swift Current. I'm racing this weekend, and like cool. yeah, I I do that a lot in the summer and fish and oh my God. yeah, hang out with my dog. <laughs> That's awesome. As I entered Manitoba, I started to see trees again for the first time because in Saskatchewan there was absolutely no tree cover. And I also started to understand why Canada was so good at hockey. Hey Steph, I'm uh, here in McGregor, Manitoba, and I'm starting to understand why uh, Canada is so good at hockey. And uh, this is why. Because all these small towns have these rinks. That's, that's pretty much all that's there. And uh, that's all they have to do. They play hockey and it's, it's amazing. Uh, when I got to Winnipeg, I got to have a few great days of rest that my body absolutely needed. It seemed like every 10 days of cycling or so, I really needed some good rest. So it was amazing to stay with Derek and his family, had some great mackerel and just got to relax and watch the Euro and it was fantastic. When I got back on the road, and into Ontario, however, I had one late day on the road and I had to stop in the forest. Hey Steph, uh, I know you can't see me. Let me do that there. Um, I'm in the woods just off the road here going to Port Thunder Bay, but I'm on the southerly route because, as you know, Derek brought me to a safer road, but it's a bit more isolated. It's okay though, I'll get through it. Um, day 21, end of the day here, but I need some motivation for my sleep because it's. I'm alone here, so when my legs hurt, I say, shut up, legs. Do what I tell you to do. Jens Voigt. German former professional road bicycle racer. I had to tell them that today, Steph, because uh, as you know, I took a couple rest days with family friends in Winnipeg and uh, just telling my legs, get back into it, get back into it. So I'm going to do that tomorrow, try to do a big day to Thunder Bay tomorrow. So fire it up. Here we go. Look at all those mosquitoes on the outside of my tent. All you could hear outside last night was everywhere outside. You could probably still hear it. I had to kill a bunch of them. That's the life out here in, in the woods. But it was my fault because I got here too late. You get here late, you in a second opening up this tent, then you're screwed. Hey Steph, so this is where I slept. The road's down there. I came up a little cliff, locked my bike, put the alarm there, but there's no one around here. This is a very isolated road. As you can see, there are no cars passing by. Um, 
but yes, today is day 22. So uh, what we'll do is we will read your little message. Uh, your message, your messages, you know, I just thought last night of your messages and pushing through and even if, even if I'm alone here, uh, in the woods, uh, I had you and my friends and family and, and God with me. So day, day 22, it says in French, tant que je respire, j'attaque. As long as I breathe, I attack. Bernard Hinault. So this was a French cyclist from 1975 to 1986, right? Um, and he won troisième. Anyway, he participated in the Tour de France. I don't want to delay it, but um, thank you, Steph. I. Uh, yeah, I'm breathing. I'm, 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 uh, I'm going here. Uh, not much water on me right now. Uh, and there's not much for the next few hundred kilometers, but we'll see the next place to stop. I'll get water. I'll be fine. I have a lot of food, so we're good to go. I love you and I'll see you soon. Heading to Thunder Bay on the 11th. So, we've hit the Atlantic watershed. From here, all streams flow south into the Atlantic Ocean. And that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. Woo! This is the home of the Stahl Brothers. Just saw a sign for that. Love the Stahls. Good hockey players. As I saw Lake Superior for the first time, I made my way up to the Terry Fox Scenic Lookout, and there I met Zach, someone who's probably crazier than anyone you've ever met, because he decided to rollerblade across Canada. Y yes, yeah, so we, so it's called Blading for Bees, okay. what I'm doing, so I'm attempting to break a Guinness World Record. Uh, insane. Yeah, so the, it's the world's longest journey on rollerblades. Oh, and yeah. I so what's the current <laughs> longest journey? Yes. Yeah. So the record right now. Yeah, the record right now. This guy in Germany in the 80s did it. His name's Peter. There's not a lot of info on him, but the current record is 8,596 kilometers. kilometers. Huh? Yeah. And so you're, you're trying to get to what? I'm trying to get to 9,000. Wow. So I just want to beat it. Like I don't just want to beat it. I want to like beat it and get yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe. Give, give yourself. Uh, <laughs> A little leeway there. Yeah. Someone tries to go over. Yeah. yeah and uh, you know what? If someone else wanted to do it, that'd be so cool. I'd be yeah. so like, I'd be so flattered. I yeah. think because <laughs> I'd feel part of the uh, the inspiration of that. Maybe yeah. so, selfishly. So that distance is actually longer than Canada, right? So you're doing a little zigzag pattern. What are you doing? Yeah. So I like so I started in, in BC and I, and because that's where I grew up, I did like a weird kind of figure eight loop in okay. BC. And then I came to the prairies and I've been doing a little bit of a zigzag and okay. like a back and forth just to make up, cause I have to make up about 2000 kilometers, maybe okay. 1500. And then in Ontario, we're going to go to the most Southern point in Ontario and back up to Toronto and in Quebec, we're going to do a little bit of zigzagging too, to make up some ground. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, this guy here, Terry Fox, we're here at the monument here uh, near Thunder Bay. Legend. How, how did he inspire you? Uh, oh man. Well, he, it's, it's, he's obviously like a, a like a canadian like icon and hero and i think he's like uh yeah I'm, i was actually thinking about this yesterday when i was skating i was like there should be a movie ab about yeah. about him um and well like, he's actually from the him and my dad and my grandpa are all from the same town and my grandpa was a teacher and he always says like he used to see terry when he was like a kid but I, oh yeah i mean i don't know if that's actually true maybe <laughs> <laughs> But who, who knows? It's my grandpa, and he's all that respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything. You, you don't say anything. You just let it go. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, who knows? Maybe he did. Right. Yeah, yeah. He was if a it's teacher. The same town. Same, right. Um, but I met a guy actually in uh, Vancouver, and he's like, "Yeah, my mom went to school, same class as Terry Fox." Oh, wild. About yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. just so wild. So he's obviously, it, it, and when you're skating and, and or, or biking, which is equally as crazy. <laughs> Uh, it's, I don't it's, think so. It's, but. All, <laughs> it's all relative, I guess. Um, 
yeah, it's like, oh, if he can do it, if he can do this, I can do this. Yeah, Especially yeah. if we're, we got wheels and hands. And, yeah, and. yeah, he's inspiring, <laughs> like, what yeah. he could do, what he did, I don't think many people could do, you know, he's special. He's, he's special. so special, so yeah. unique, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's, it's definitely... Yeah, it helps to think think about him and yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, sometimes I think his about his legacy. Him yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. how many how many kilometers are you doing per day? Uh, per day I go on average about 120. So in the Rocky Mountains I was doing like 70, 90 ish a day. How, per, was that scary going downhill? It was pretty scary. Literally <laughs> what you do, you have to like wait on the side of the highway because the shoulders are so rocky sometimes, yeah, as you know. Bad, eh? Yeah, and then in BC. In BC and then sometimes they're small, so you literally wait, you're like, okay, there's I think there's a big gap in traffic. And on rollerblades, the a pebble will like hit your rock, and you're like, oh. So I just like would go on the actual road, and and just hope no semis would come. And if like a big truck would come, I'd kind of be like half on the road. Usually I try to make eye contact with them yeah. and and give them like, oh, I'm sorry, like a dumb wave, like oh, thank you. <laughs> and then hopefully they slow have down. You, have you wiped out? Uh, yeah. So I actually uh, oh, don't tell my mom this because I haven't <laughs> told my mom yet because she would just cancel my whole trip. But in Alberta, I hit like a patch of dirt and I fell, and then it. It's all, it's, it, was like, it was like about three weeks ago, but I have a big scratch here and on my hip and up here. Yikes. And I fell and I actually knocked myself out. Did like cold. Really? Yeah, so I was in, I went to the hospital. <laughs> and uh, I went to the hospital and I had like a CT scan and everything happened, but, but the doctor cleared me. He's like, okay. He was like this, he actually loved bees as well. So it was kind of oh, perfect. Yeah. He's like, and he was um, from Europe. I'm not exactly sure where, but he, this is my like horrible impression of him. He was literally like, we need to get you back on the road, Zach. <laughs> it was so funny. And he's like, you need to wait five days. But I waited, so I waited two days, but kind of just like flip the five backwards it's the same difference oh right and um, but then i just like started super slow and if i ever felt dizzy or or like any like kind of concussion symptoms i i, I stopped but i actually never felt any but i started okay. slow and now i'm back to full strength oh i think <laughs> so I, did you, how, you hit your head yeah i don't remember anything to be completely okay. honest i remember skating past my sister who's in the support vehicle yeah. and and then i remember waking up or I remember being on the side of the road on the other side of the highway sitting on a patch of grass and I was on the phone with her and that's there's like the gap which is really kind of crazy and there's actually Be careful man I'm yeah for you. <laughs> I got a I got a new expensive helmet <laughs> that, so that's that's oh, yeah it, were you wearing one at the time I was wearing a helmet oh 100% okay, okay. if I wasn't it probably would have been pretty bad I imagine so wear your helmets oh, I was we have a lot of like little kids following us yeah, oh, uh, yeah. following the journey yeah because uh, so it's called the blading for bees it's actually a not-for-profit that I started okay. as well oh, wow. so I, I've been a carpenter my whole life um, like building fancy custom homes for rich people and um, learned so much, but uh, I want to change my direction in life. So uh, I started this not for profit. So in the fall, um, I'm trying to like put together like a mini curriculum and programs. We're going to go and talk to students uh, and just get them super like fired up about like climate change and the environment. That's yeah, so yeah. Right? So yeah, it's it's really like relative, especially uh, like nowadays. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Then, that's yeah. what I see all these amazing things when on the trip, and you're like, are these beautiful mountains gonna be here? Are we gonna be here? Yeah, right. Are, are these like old growth forests? Who? Yeah. It's yeah. and it's so wild how because uh, like things obviously need to change on kind of like a government level yeah. and but everyone kind of needs to no one needs to like drastically change but we all need to make like small changes yeah. i think it's so important um so so how yeah how you were telling me a little bit before how even on this trip you're trying to keep your footprint small how have you been doing that um so pretty much we so i have uh a van that I built and I bought out. So me and uh, my team, so it's pretty much just my sister. We had a couple of random friends come in uh, and help us for like a day or two or a week. Uh, but mainly it's just the two of us. Wow. And we do everything out of the van. And I have like a whole solar system installed. Nice. So all like our charging for like the GPS's and our laptops and everything is all solar. And oh, yeah, so it's pretty sweet. So, and we do, we don't have, we, I couldn't afford an electric. Yeah. van because they're like hundreds of thousands of dollars but um so so it is like a it's actually a diesel van which isn't obviously great yeah. for the environment but i think it's a really cool kind of example that because we can't obviously just like stop using fossil fuels yeah. right away the the, the two transition. the trend there needs to be we need to work yeah. together and 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 because yeah it's not going to work if we all just like are fighting all the yeah, time yeah you yeah <laughs> transition properly and 
and the end goal should be to get away from it, right? That's that's what we're doing, and that's what you're doing on this trip. Right? Yeah, attempting to, yeah, trying to get people fired up. But yeah, I think it's cool. Yeah, it's do, pretty do sweet. Do you think you'll be tired of rollerblading after this trip? <laughs> Will you say I'm throwing these away? Or I'll definitely be sick of like marathon rollerblading because okay. the skates I have are kind of like speed skates. Yeah. Um, but maybe probably for at least a few months I'll be like I'm yeah. gonna take a break. Yeah, me too. On the bike. <laughs> I know. I was gonna say I was gonna. I'll ask. be like, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll leave this uh, <laughs> in the garage in the for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. day I met a guy named Alexi and we went on some bumpy construction roads in Ontario and it was a tough ride so it was nice to have him with me. And so there was, this was a friend of a friend who allowed me to stay in her backyard okay. um, and I hear her voice like she's coming to like say good morning and all that because I think she's about to head out for work um, and then like I see this head peek out from the bottom of the tent like just huge like fluffy dog like super adorable <laughs> it like starts ripping right into the the side of the tent and I was like a couple days into the trip you know it's like not a cheap tent <laughs> either no, no. and not only that but it's mostly I was concerned that it's you know it's my one home <laughs> for yeah, the trip exactly. and like so I ripped but through the got, side you got it patched up yeah and then thankfully some other um, really kind person that I met later on was like just spend the whole evening just stitching it up um, as well as like some other holes I don't know if you're sure where they came from but like make sure that 99% of the holes are covered 100% oh maybe yeah, bugs don't get mosquitoes, in mosquitoes yeah. yeah yeah we were saying in Ontario the bugs chase yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like a couple days ago was the absolute worst of the trip. <laughs> <It was bad. laughs> like, you know, you have like 50 mosquitoes swarming your body at the same time. You're just... <laughs> and the flies. And it creates like a real sense of urgency. You're trying to set up your tent. Yes. <laughs> and you're just like, you, you can't even like, yeah. Okay, so good morale in cycling comes from good legs. Um, Sean Yates. Okay. And, uh, English former professional cyclist. He was in inducted into the British Cycling Hall of Fame in 2009. Okay. Good. So do you think the quote applies to uh, today? <laughs> well, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like our legs are in pretty good shape by now, but even with that, like... <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really tough, eh? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, my I god. I to push them up. But, uh, no, the le good legs definitely help. <laughs> good legs help, but not... Yeah. I don't, usually your, your quotes are good, but this one was not good today. Anyway. Yeah, shame. No, I'm just kidding. That was, that was a good one. We're here at uh, Lake Superior. It's beautiful. And uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Peace. So Rachel here from Blading uh, for Bees. You know, the guy who's rollerblading across Canada and going to beat the Guinness World Record. He has to do a zigzag pat pattern to beat the record. She went, she got me groceries because she was going to get him groceries, so how nice is that of her? So nice. Hi there. How are you? <laughs> Thank you so much, eh? Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. After doing a shorter day with Alexi, I left him and actually Zach had made up some ground. So we stayed on a campsite together. For a day 25, I'm going to get him to read it. I feel honored. Yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> Look how beautiful you, she wrote all, all this. Yeah, and there you folded go. everything. Yeah. Should, okay, should I just go for it? Go for it. Haha, uh, to me, it doesn't matter whether it's raining or the sun is shining or whatever. As long as I'm riding a bike, I know I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Mark Cardenish, British professional road cyclist. He's considered one of the greatest road sprinters of all times. That's cool. pretty good. Yeah, be on yeah. your bike. It's magical. It's a magical, Did wonderful thing. Do you feel the thing. same way about your blades? 100 percent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very lucky. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Your your reading was on uh, on point there, man. Yeah, you were nervous. I know. Uh, heart's beating pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks.
Bye. It's, dark. it's uh, day 26. Just woke up. Bit of a sleepy head this morning. But we want to get an early start with uh, our Blading for Bees friend. I tented out here. We're at White Lake in Ontario. Day 26. Let's open it up. Crashing is part of cycling, as crying is part of love. You're, gi you're giving her, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going pretty quick. We're, uh... Yeah, we are. It's too hundo, bro. We didn't quite get to 200 kilometers that day. I got to 191, Zach got to 180, which is crazy on rollerblades. He actually beat that later. That was his longest day up until that point. He, I know he cracked 200 later on and he did beat the Guinness World Record. He smashed it, he got to 10,000 kilometers, amazing. But eventually I left Zach and his sister and I continued on in Ontario and I got to Agua and they had this great fish and chips place and I got to interview one of the employees who did MMA. Yes, I trained uh, with uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu at first and I started training under my coach, uh, Byron Phillips. Uh, I made it, uh, I think it was uh, with uh, the standing I had was uh, top 10 in Ontario, something oh like gosh. that, can't remember. But wow. no longer, <laughs> I have, uh, I have uh, stop fighting i mean he helped people train and get ready for their fights now oh, yeah. uh, my coach byron phillips he still does that i try to help him out whenever i can okay. um, he's an amazing coach he brought me from almost not being able to fight at all to being able to step in the cage and take on my opponent past sault st marie ontario i had to stop and watch the euro final italia inglaterra i had to stop and watch it and when I was there, I saw this guy walk in with the Del Piero jersey. So he had the same idea as I did to get the Tim Hortons Wi-Fi to watch it. But at the time, there were still those COVID restrictions. So the employees were trying to kick us out. They were saying they're going to call the police, blah, 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 blah. We sort of ignored them. And my boy here, he had a special shirt made for the occasion. Today I'm here with Abdul and Italy just won <laughs> the Euros. Look at his shirt. It's not, it's not coming, coming home. home. When did you have the shirt made? This this shirt was made right before the England-Ukraine game. So that's how confident I was that England wasn't going to make it and win the whole Euros. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty happy about it. If you, if you actually go close in, you can see that we removed some of the flowers from the three lion heads and each one of the lions is actually crying. And I've got a nice <laughs> little quote on the back here. Yeah, look at this. Football is a sport where 22 men chase the ball for 90 minutes and at the end the English are always bitter because they haven't won anything since 66. And uh, guess what? It still stands true today because Italy just took home the Euros. They did, they did. Don't worry about that. All right. Uh, <laughs> so what did you think of uh, England's performance and the game? You know what? With a team with that much depth and a team with that much investment from like foreign, you know, I don't know, investors and whatnot, like their league is the best league in the world is what they claim and whatnot. Yeah, and all claim. this hype, the media is all over. Uh, for them to, to get to the final and then choke on a level like this uh, is, is laughable in my opinion. I think that, <laughs> I think that you know... It's uh, not, but like, Italy's a good team, right? But it's like, it's, they assumed they were going to win because they were at home yeah, and it, it's the, coming home. They it, didn't even have, they, they didn't win a Euro, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> They've never won a Euro. It's been, what, like 55 years since they won an international trophy. And even that is debated. They say that the 66 World Cup, you know, is questionable. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. But they, they say that it might not even have been theirs. And um, <laughs> for them to be so overhyped and underperform every single tournament since I was a kid, this is just, you know, it's another another day at the office for, for, for the English team, you know? Like, it's like overhyped as always. So, I mean... Congratulations to them for making it to the final, but, uh, <laughs> you know, they're going to have to try again. <laughs> the previous few days, I started having bike problems again, and I got to a point where I couldn't even really pedal. It was so bad, and I was in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how this happened. I was in the middle of nowhere in Marathon, Ontario, and I was just praying. I said... Please, God, <laughs> help me somehow here. It's this bike, it's not working. And I was literally in the middle of nowhere and I looked to my left and on the door, there was this paper, I'm not making this up, that said, oh, we do bike repairs. So I went there and it was closed, but this guy was walking by with his dog, small town Ontario. And he said, oh yeah, that's my dad. Uh, 
uh, let me go get him. So <laughs> he took about 15 minutes, walked his dog, went back, got his dad, and they came back. Two guys from Newfoundland, actually. And they did their best to just get my bike up to speed so I could ride it back to Toronto where I could fix it up originally from Toronto so I could fix it up at a bike shop because the chain had been stretched and actually the following day uh, after Italy had won the Euros I had to boost to the ferry because I was taking the ferry down to Tobermory and I rode 207 kilometers in the fastest time I'd ever done it and when I got there they said the ferries you can't ride this ferry because of COVID, blah, blah, blah. You need to be here four hours in advance. It was ridiculous. I took my gloves like a little kid and I whipped them against the wall. I was so, so upset. But luckily everything happened for a reason. And I snuck on this guy's pickup truck and got on the ferry. And that guy was actually going toward Toronto. So you know what? I said, okay, my parents convinced me. Just go with him and we'll meet you halfway and I'll, and I'll come get you. So uh, I got some rest again that night. It was incredible to see my family again and just everything happened for a reason. When I was in Toronto, I had to get my bike fixed obviously. So I went to Chain Reaction, a great shop in Etobicoke and I spoke with Leslie, who had given me some advice before the trip even, some great advice that saved my life a few times going into the drops down on the hills and she saved my life a few times because I, I might have died out there. But anyway, she's a, a former professional cyclist, amazing woman and so caring, so kind. Yeah, so my career in cycling um, really started with the trip and when I came back from that, um, I'd had a love for cross-country running okay. and I realized that you can actually, on, with, with cross-country mountain biking, you don't have to run, <laughs> but it's kind of the same thing. You're yeah. going through the woods and <laughs> enjoying nature and, and riding your bike. So I thought I'd give it a try. So in 1992, I started racing um, in the Provincial Ontario Cup circuit. Wow. Um, and because I was fit from having ridden across Canada the year before, I opted to go in the 40 kilometer event, which was actually the expert category. And I didn't realize, and at that time they weren't super organized, so they didn't tell me um, oh what, they didn't tell me that you're supposed to start in beginner and work up to sport and then to expert. Okay. Just sort of said, hey, what category are you in? And I said, expert, and there I was. So, so I jumped right in there. Jumped right in there, did the first three races in O Cup, and then that um, September, uh, it was uh, September uh, 1992, and it was the World Championships in Bromont, Quebec. And I signed up for it in the expert category, planning to go on the Friday and then hang out and watch the big race on the Sunday or the Saturday. And when I was there, or sorry, a week before I got there to the race, they called me and said, hey, we don't have enough uh, expert women, so you'll be racing on Saturday with the pros. Really? And I was like, oh, but I, I told them about the confusion, how yeah, it really yeah, should have yeah. been. And the girl on the phone was like, well, have you ever raced expert before? I'm like, yeah, three times. She goes, well, then you're racing pro. Wow, just like so, that. <laughs> so that's how you got on the pro circuit Yeah, like that. <laughs> just like that. So there I was, not just the pro circuit, it was the world championships. The world championships. <laughs> just in, there, just like in that. there like that. That would never, ever happen again. <laughs> it wouldn't happen today? Uh, no, in fact, even like within a, you know, a year or two, like probably was the only time it ever happened. Um, really? Uh, and then it took me a few years um, until 1996 when I actually made the Canadian national team in order to... Um, race worlds for 1996 Amazing. so so we're talking mountain biking again. yeah cross country, cross country mountain, biking. mountain biking and in the day um we have a bike here this is not the exact uh frame that i used for that race but it's one year later i had switched all the parts are the same parts i used in that 1992 race so the full xtr um has an uh Ibis titanium stem, Merlin titanium bar, Merlin titanium seat post, and um, it did have a um, RockShock Mag 21 on the front, 
but so yeah this so was this is, the, this is from 93 this was 93 in 92 i had a bond tiger frame but okay. this is an ibis um and this is my current model of ibis that was a mojo this is a ripley this is a really cool bike. <laughs> and this one also has a little bit of my custom design artwork on it. Uh, wow. I'm an artist and uh, there's this great company called Bike Shield and they um, will custom make any graphics you want. And so really? I created these. Um, this is my Screaming Trees bike. And these are my little Screaming Trees with all their cute little slogans on there. So <laughs> what was the idea behind that, the Screaming Trees? Uh, there's a trail in Peterborough, Peterborough's my hometown, and there's this, uh, con it's called the Harold Town Conservation Area, and at Harold Town they um, have some really cool trails, and my favorite is Screaming Trees. So I decided when it came time to custom wrap my bike that um, I was inspired by Harold Town Screaming Trees and came up with these little cartoons. and. And then it's really great, so it'll withstand lots of abrasions. And eventually, if you want, you can just peel it off and the bike's oh, yeah. like brand new underneath. After leaving Leslie behind in Toronto, I hopped on my newly repaired bike and stayed a night with family friends in Brockville, thanks a lot, and then made my way to the Quebec border. <laughs> I'll go right into the sign. Hey, Stan. Look what I brought for you. I brought you this. I want you to read it. Day, day, which day is it? Uh, it's day 31. Told you it was going to be a month. Yeah. Okay, go, go, go. <laughs> Embrace your sweat. It is your essence and your emancipation. Who, who's your favorite professional cyclist today? I think that was, uh, you know, the dopings came after. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, in my time, that was not the doping, but I, I saw, okay, Bernardino, uh, Eddie Merckx, and when you see the the, the way Eddie Merckx buy, uh, take the, all the the race, you know, yeah. win the Six Jours de Paris 11 times. Crazy. Yeah, he went four Tour de France, he went Four Giro d'Italia, three uh, Espana Tour. So you can beat that. That's like a Schumacher. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Gretzky, you know, that's that's the best. Uh, For sure. Is, yeah. the, are the, is there anyone today that impresses you right, uh, racing today, right now? Uh, I will say, uh, you know, after one year, I don't, I don't saw the Tour de France, but yeah. uh, that was before that was Contador. Okay. And uh, Froome was very good from England. Okay. Was very good. He went three too. So. And what about that Canadian guy who is? Uh, yeah, that's uh, Michael Woods. Yeah. Uh, he was in the Tour de France this year. Yeah. He finished in the top five in a uh, few steps, but he was 38. So he said, with with my position 38, I got to leave the Tour de France and prepare my my body for the the Olympics. Yes. He quit. He left the yeah he left yeah, the, yeah yeah. He left the, the race. So he, yeah. He's going to make, we want to see it, the Olympics is very good. He, yeah, he's strong, yeah. Very strong, and yeah, yeah. his story is quite incredible. He's gone from otherwise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After a beautiful ride with my girlfriend and her father, I stopped a few more times to see some more family, grandparents, uncles, aunts. And then after a few days of rest in Montreal, I left for Trois-Rivières. Three rivers. Round two. Il paradiso in terra. I was in Italian. <laughs> non esiste ma madu madi. I ma thought it would ma most, of them, most of them are English or French. Un bicicletta si ani aniversa comunque. <laughs> comunque. Let me no. see. Comunque. Comunque. Let's see. Il paradiso in terra non esiste, ma eh, chi va con bicicletta ci arriverà comunque. Ok, so, yeah, you'll get there, get to heaven with the, with the bike. Ma Mauro Panini. No, Perini. 
Right. Good evening, your funny name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Peter. <laughs> Off to Three Rivers today. I wish you were coming, but. All right, Jour Trondeur, on to Turtle Tree. Okay. Here with Mikey, we went to Three Rivers, Trois Rivières, yesterday. And he's heading back to Montreal. I'm heading on to Quebec. How was biking? 150, Mikey. Uh, it was tough. It was a lot of fun. I'm glad I did it. But the mental battle, like the ups and downs, was it was tough. But I'm happy I did it. Good. <laughs> so can you read uh, that? Yeah, day 33. Yeah. Little note from his girlfriend. Your bike is discovery. Your bike is freedom. Doesn't matter where you are. When you're on the saddle, you're taken away. Doug Donaldson. What do you think? Do you agree? Yeah, it is. Your bike is discovery. Your bike is freedom. I said it yesterday. It's pretty amazing what two wheels can do and how far it can take you. Yeah. And well, how did you get into cycling? Pandemic. Um, <laughs> I was always interested in the sport, but when the pandemic hit last year, I needed to find something to, to get into. And it was one of the few activities that you could do. And I'm completely hooked. So got into cycling, but this is the first ever touring slash bikepacking trip. Yeah. And it'll be a while before I go on another one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, we had to sleep together in a tent. That was fun, hey, Mikey? <laughs> yeah, it was fun. He tried to snuggle. I said, no, stay. No, no, Don't he, worry. he's lying. <laughs> in Quebec, I got to enjoy some simply astounding churches. It was a really beautiful part of the trip from Kingston, Ontario, all the way to Rivière du Loup, Quebec, because it's relatively flat. People say Saskatchewan's flat, but this part was definitely the flattest part of the country so i really got to enjoy it get off and you get to get off the highway like the trans canada which is really loud and noisy and you have to be very careful that you're not going to get hit by a car so this was really enjoyable i got to enjoy some trails and meet up with romain again who hosted me he's the gentleman from lac louise uh, he hosted me in beautiful beautiful quebec city it was simply wonderful and then after leaving Romain, that's when I started having problems again. I got to Rivière du Loup, Quebec, and I went to Mass that morning. And my tire, my tire was giving me problems again. I thought it was just a leak or something, but it was a, it was a complete flat. And I wanted a professional to take a look at it because I just kept on getting these flats. And I had had professionals take a look at it and they fixed it, blah, 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 kept getting flats. I should have changed the tire uh, earlier on. I didn't for the entire trip. And for the rest of the journey all the way to Charlottetown, I kept having problems. But the guy at the bike shop in Rivière du Loup, I, I, I knocked on the door. It was Sunday, it was supposedly closed. He was working on bikes down there. And it was pouring, pouring, pouring rain. And he said, I'm sorry, I'm too busy, I can't help you. Je suis vraiment désolé, uh, but I can't. And I, I was pleading with him, okay, can you give me a, a pump, this, that? Because my tire was really hard to get off as well. And eventually, I think he just pitied me so much. After two hours, I was out there in the pouring rain. He came out and he did it for me. Uh, of course, I compensated him, but he did it for me. And he said... I've never seen tires like this. Je n'ai jamais vu des pneus comme ça. And he said they were so hard to manipulate. He said, you're not going to get across the country like this. And I said, he thought I was coming from Halifax. And I said, well, I got here. But in the final push, the final test, in those last five difficult days of riding, I realized that cycling is no game. Le cyclisme n'est pas... Ce n'est pas un jeu, c'est un sport dur, terrible, impitoyable, qui exige de très gros sacrifices. On joue au football, tennis, golf, hockey, mais on ne joue pas au cyclisme. So it's very dark, as you can see in New Brunswick. I just got uh, screened, I guess you can say, at the border there. For the COVID, uh, you know, you have to be vaccinated to get in and all that. So they did check my registration number, asked me for my vaccination proof there. It was all good. 
So we're good and uh, yeah. This is a bit of a scary campsite. But it's twelve dollars and forty two cents with tax, so a nice rate for cyclists. It's perfect. I'm gonna set up right here. Bye. And good night. Hi there, Steph. It's day 36, Uruk uh, Concert. And I'm just at a provincial park, the first provincial park when you enter New Brunswick uh, to go through all the COVID screening and all that stuff that they do. Uh, but got in okay. Right when I put up my tent last night, it just started pouring out of nowhere, pouring. I mean, it had been raining quite a lot the whole day but it had stopped and then it just started pouring out of nowhere so my whole tent got wet it was a disaster I had to use my towel just to get a nice dry spot in my tent and then put in the mat and like you guys know had problems with patching it up and all that yesterday so I didn't sleep last night or sorry two nights ago uh, but last night I just conked out here it was beautiful had a nice warm shower, $12.42 for this beautiful provincial park campground for cyclists. Um, that's pretty cool. And this is the first one that they have these, um, you know, bike racks here where you can lock up your bike. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And I'm really happy about that. I'm just letting everything dry. I think I lost an hour or I'm going to lose an hour quite soon. Um, I think I've already lost it. And uh, I've got to do 350k by tomorrow night to get to a family friend's house in St. Stephen. So I'm really looking forward to it. Let's read day 36. And thank you again to the guy in Riviera Judo who helped me with the, the old front tire. So this one, <laughs> I see it as a short one. Unleash your legs. I repeated those three words in my head incessantly on days 36 and 37. On day 36, I stayed with a family on a family farm because the campground was closed. I just asked and they were the nicest people, offered me shepherd's pie. And on day 37, with 230 kilometers left to St. Stephen, everything went wrong. My gear shifter, uh, the cable snapped early on. Then I got a flat with 70 kilometers left. But I got there safe and sound, and the next day I interviewed the family on in the Bay of Fundy. Where are we now, Mary? We are in Oak Bay. We have the Bay of Fundy behind us, and we're in New Brunswick. Perfect. And uh, what's so special about this uh, Bay of Fundy? Here? So this Bay of Fundy, the water comes in every six hours, and it goes completely out every six hours. So it's absolutely freezing because it's all the tide's always coming in and out. And you can only swim at like at a certain part of the day. Okay, and uh, where we're standing right now, yeah. when will it be full of water? Um, what time? Do you know? I don't know when high tide is, but I'd say this, where we're standing right now, will be covered in water next hour. Max. So the outcrop of rocks there, when the tide goes out, the guys come from over that point, And as the tide's going out, they have their little motorboat and they go over there and they park all day long. And there's three, sometimes four of them. They have orange vests on and they dig for clams all day long. Now the clams that they dig here can't be eaten straight away. They have taken to a central processing facility and they have to be flushed out because at certain times of the year, there's something called a red tide, which means that there's bacteria. Okay. And um, so you'll get really, really, really bad food poisoning if you eat them. So they make a, probably a couple hundred bucks each a day, apparently depending on how many they collect. Really? And they're taken off and, yep, flushed and sold to wherever, you know, people who export so clams. So how, how do they dig them up? So they've just got kind of like a little trowel and they've got waders on and this trowel and, the, and it's back-breaking work. You see them all day out there, bent over, digging the clams up and throwing them in their buckets and, and that's it. Day 38. Cut 
Commitment is pushing yourself when no one else is around. Anonymous. Thank you. <laughs> Do you agree? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Before leaving my goddaughter and her family behind in St. Stephen, they helped me find this guy working on bikes out of his garage called Coastal Bicycle. You know, a small town in St. Stephen. And he fixed up the cable on my bike, it was amazing. Then I biked about 100k to St. John, tented outside of the ferry, took the ferry over to Nova Scotia, and had two relaxing days of cycling. Very nice, beautiful Nova Scotia. And my trip ended in Halifax, as you probably expect. It's fitting that I end this journey with a flat tire. Because I've had so many. I had the real temptation to go and essentially throw my bike into the Atlantic Ocean, dip it in there, and complete the coast-to-coast -coast journey. But I wanted to wait for my girlfriend. I knew it would be a special moment for us. I didn't tell her that, but I knew I wanted to wait for her to do it with her because both of our grandparents arrived in Halifax along that Atlantic Ocean and Pier 21. So I wanted to wait for her. We wouldn't actually dip it in the Atlantic until a week later because we went, spent a week going around Halifax, renting a car going up to the Cabot Trail, and of course, visiting the Pier 21 Museum. How do you feel to be at Pier 21? Uh, it's really emotional. Um, it's, it's so nice. We had a guided tour and it was so nice to learn how uh, our grandparents came here, how the process was and what they had to go through. Um, it makes us grateful. It makes me grateful, for example. I can talk for myself, but uh, it makes me so grateful for um, everything that they've done for us. And uh, it's, it's a day that I'll remember for sure forever. And did you like the cabins and all the stuff? Yeah, it was it was really nice because they kind of recreated um, uh, how it was back in the days, smaller. Uh, so we can see the the cabins. Um, how was the immigration process before they, they actually saw and met? How with they a, confiscated food how and they, everything. Yeah, yeah. The train. Yeah, how they went on the train and. Um, uh, yeah, we're it's it's, it's crazy all the because, stories. So, yes, yeah. because we're we're seeing what we've heard of for years and years and years, and um, the fact to see even luggages and the uh, the plates that they were eating in on on the the boat is 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 pretty special, I'd say. And to to know that you know the boat came from this side and arrived here, and we're walking you during the visit. You can't see it's very foggy. Yeah. During the visit, the, um, uh, the tour guide said, well, now you're stepping where your ancest ancestries, um, ancestors, yeah, yeah. ancestors stepped for the first time. And that was, that was pretty emotional because yeah. it was the first step in, in Canada. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Before finally dipping our tires in the very port in which our grandparents arrived and continuing our journey to Charlottetown, we had a pleasant, beautiful little vacation, seeing where hockey was invented, visiting the place of the Acadian deportation, chilling on the beach, bathing in waterfalls, eating wonderful maritime food, seeing where John Cabot arrived, meeting Gus, the oldest gopher tortoise in the world at 99 years of age, Joking around. Watermelon. Do you think that it's sweet? <laughs> <laughs> and appreciating heavenly views. They will never know the beauty of this place, see the seasons change, enjoy nature's chorus. All we enjoy we owe to them, men and women who lie buried in the earth of foreign lands and the seven seas. 
dedicated to the memory of Canadians who died overseas in the service of their country and so preserved our heritage. how our grandparents arrived right there, you know. And ending the trip here, it's, it's pretty special. All right, you get yours. You're starting yours, we're going up to Charlottetown, or Cavendish, and then back to Charlottetown, flying out. It's the beginning of a long journey, are you ready? <laughs> Woo! Oh, watch your feet, oh my gosh. She got her shoes all wet. <laughs> well, your grandparents arrived here too, so that's that's pretty special. Let's let's go to Charlottetown. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> we took the ferry over to Dartmouth, where earlier that morning at the Nova Scotia archives. I learned that my first ancestor in Canada on the other side of my family was buried in the 1800s. We were already running very late because Steph had problems setting up her bike, but we just had to interview the fellow in yellow who stopped us at the Dartmouth Ferry Terminal. Because it wasn't anybody honking. I wasn't getting that support maybe when I needed it then. So I was on my own to kind of figure it out. And as I was going up that hill, I was starting to defeat myself. Uh, I started literally cursing <laughs> as I was going up that hill. And the harder it got with every step, the louder those curses became until I started to hear myself echo off the hills around me. Really? And I'm like, who is hearing you right now? The people driving by can't really hear you. Uh, the bears, they hear you, they're just waiting for you to fall. <laughs> Um, the, the chipmunks that are chatting in the trees, they don't care, you know, and when I yelled out a son of a, you know that word, and her to come back and slap me across the face, who are you really cursing out here? You're cursing yourself. So this is what you got to do. You've, you train to do this. Go back to sets and repetitions. Let's do 50 steps, stop. Do 100 steps, stop. Do 150 steps, stop. To 100 steps, stop. To 50 steps, stop. And so I did that. And before too long, I found myself gradually making it up that hill. Wow. Again, five hours later, but I did it. And then all the way across Canada. Yeah, you know, like, a, a lot of people would say like, you know, you, you must be just overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, you must be worried. Yeah, but where do I begin? You know, and, and so some of those worries, you actually just sit aside for the focus. Well, what's my focus? There's a road, there's a horizon. Now, that horizon is where you, you gotta go. And it goes to one of my sayings, if you hang your head at your failings, you'll never see success on the horizon. Sure. And so, that's, yeah. <laughs> and, and you do this for a cause, I see, or? It, uh, when people ask what my cause is, again, I say the B cause. Again, because I can. Uh, but this because here is uh, a little camp in Nova Scotia called Brigadoon Village. Okay. And it supports children with special needs. Amazing. So on top of that, I was a child myself with special needs. Uh, I got struck by a car here uh, growing up in Nova Scotia. I was rushed uh, by ambulance to the Victoria General Hospital across the harbor here. And I spent a month and a half there. Well, I uh, underwent 10, 11, 12 different surgeries. Uh, had a cast on up to here for uh, 10 months. Had an open wound down to my bone for a year and a half. So those are definitely special needs. So I, I have the empathy to understand that children that are facing cancer and diabetes and diseases like that, uh, gee, they just need to just be a kid and get away from that and uh, meet people in their own peer group. 
to help them navigate through what they may have to navigate through. And I, and I have another saying, if you reach a child that can remember, you'll have an adult that won't forget. The fellow in yellow was definitely an encounter we'd never forget. But as I was interviewing him, I kept on looking at my girlfriend and looking at the clouds and the sky and saying, we're not gonna be able to do any biking here today. It's getting dark. But we did as much as we could, but we knew we'd have to push in the next few days if we wanted to make it to the ferry to get to PEI. And my girlfriend, she didn't train at all before this trip, but she pushed and pushed and pushed and I was just so proud of her. You done, you ready? Yeah. Day 42. So it says, hmm, I don't ride a bike to add days to my life. I ride a bike to add life to my days. Beautiful. Day 45, it's all done. Uh, what can I say? We'll see what this says. Um, Alex Supertramp once said, which I believe was one of the first quotes or the first quote, the joy of life comes from our encounters with new experiences and hence there is no greater joy than to have an endlessly challenging or changing horizon for each day to have a new and different sun. After my girlfriend and I packed our bikes and hopped on a plane home, we couldn't help but count our blessings. There is truly nothing better in the world than having a new and different sun each and every day. But unfortunately, not everyone is afforded the same opportunity as we are. When I got home, I visited the Society of St. Vincent de Paul for whom I was raising funds along my journey. They do amazing things for abandoned children, the poor, needy, and prisoners, all of whom need love and a second chance to see a new sun, a new horizon. My girlfriend prepared 45 quotes for me during this journey, and I really wish she wrote one for me every day of my life. You know, she's loving, but I don't think she's that loving. But as I release this mini doc exactly 365 days after day one, I would like to end things by dedicating a quote to all the generous souls without whom I have never made it even one kilometer across this country. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? 
The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. God bless you and thank you to everyone who helped me along this journey. Ah, yes! I know! Go! <laughs> It's funny, the line you chose was, live on a farm. <laughs> Cross the Atlantic. That's a good one. Okay, you better. Whose writing's nicer? Yours. Because <laughs> you're a teacher. Oh, yeah. What do you think, being in Newfoundland, do you, do you think that you're different from the rest of Canada, in a way? Yeah, in a way, it has its own like distinct culture, or our own way of speaking, our own food. So I guess there is like an extra bit of pride we have. And I guess when you're there in Newfoundland and you know you're born and raised in Newfoundland, you kind of get that extra bit of respect from the people. For sure, for sure. Uh, could you share something uh, that they'd say in Newfoundland that I wouldn't know, for example, maybe? <laughs> uh, where did your father fish to? Like, does that mean where are you from? Where did your father fish to? Wow. <laughs> that's a good one, that's a good one.